Good afternoon. Have you ever trembled before the Lord, before our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father? Have you ever trembled? I tremble before our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, about what you and I are going to be discussing today, and Lord willing, tomorrow. Um, these devils, these prophetic word devils, these prophetic visionaries, you know, the Lord gave me something and I have to release it today. Like that devil witch spirit move ministries or that devil witch uh, keys to the kingdom. Okay. These people who God spoke to me and they have these. Pro no, no. See, those wicked scoundrel devils, they have no fear of God before their eyes. They have no fear of God because they're going to give an account for the heresy and the evil and the wickedness that they speak. Just like these evil, uh, easy believism, wicked devils who tell you that it's faith alone from Genesis onto Revelation. They call themselves dispensational, but they're not dispensational. Okay. All right. They have no fear of God before their eyes. They have no fear of God before their eyes because they're going to give an account for the heresy that they have taught. And they're going to give an account for all the people that they have led astray. And the subject that we are going to be talking about today is rightly dividing the word of truth. This is so serious that I shudder. I tremble to speak to you about it. But who is? Some are touching on it, yes. But see, if people would rightly divide the word of truth, so many of your problems would not be there. Okay? But rightly divide the word of truth. We are going to be talking about dispensations. Okay? This is the beginning. This is going to be definitely a two-part video at least. Part one today, part two tomorrow, Lord willing, okay? I'm not going to do them both in one day, okay? Because each of these videos are going to deserve your full attention. Not for me, but what say it, the scriptures, okay? Now, get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James Version, the Word of God. Okay, and turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, it's important that you, you follow me along in the scriptures. Okay, it's very important because people are not being told to rightly divide the word of truth. Hence, you get these prophetic dreamers, these prophetic visionaries who come in telling you and, and twisting Acts, the book of Acts, and twisting it to justify themselves as if they are Old Testament prophets, as if God speaks like that today and he doesn't. If you would rightly divide the word of truth, most of you wouldn't have this problem. Second Timothy chapter 2. Context here. Verses 11 on to verse 16. Follow me along. Word for word, verse by verse. I ain't playing with you. Okay? This ain't milk. We're going to, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. Because when you get into the dispensations, you can get very technical. And you can, on one dispensation, besides the very first dispensation or age in scripture, um, you could spend eight hours on virtually every single dispensation and still not cover all the finer details. Truly, with the exception of the very first dispensation, because that is the simplest and most basic to expound upon and a great example of, and a great debunking of these wicked devils who say that it's faith alone from Genesis unto Revelation. Okay? We're going to keep this as simple as possible. We're going to point out the conditions and how these dispensations end, pretty much, okay? But, 2 Timothy chapter 2, context. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse. Verses 11 on to verse 17 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Come on, I'm playing with you. It's ain't fun time, okay? 
It is a faithful saying. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, that's not talking about salvifically, salvation. You come to the Lord on his terms today in this dispensation, okay, and uh, brokenness, contrition, and fear the Lord. You call upon his name and he save you. You're once saved, always saved, sealed unto the day of redemption, eternally secure. This is not talking about salvation, okay? This is talking about other forms of blessing that can come to you for doing things the Lord's way. If you deny him, he will deny you blessings and stuff like that. Um, mercies and that kind of stuff. This is not talking about salvation, okay? Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Why? Because we are part of his bones and of his body, okay? We belong unto the Lord. We are not little Christs, but we belong unto him, okay? Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. To words to no profit. Okay? Words to no profit. Rapture. Rapture isn't in the scriptures. Okay? <laughs> Rapture isn't in the scripture. All right? Good example. Okay? Bible. It's not in the scriptures. Another good example. See, to no profit. The prophet is in saying, hey, rapture is not in scripture. The redemption of the purchased possession is. See, the prophet is getting you away from man's terms and sticking to the terms of the scriptures. Okay? Bible is not in the scriptures. Taking away from man's words and sticking with the scriptures, it is profit. It is profitable unto you. Okay? Just an example. Let's continue. Here it is. Verse 15. Study to shew thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings. Why? For they will increase unto more ungodliness, becoming like the world. Okay? Now, looking at verse 15, uh, I'll leave a link in the description box for this Bible hub. You look in the Bible, see, this is, <laughs> it's to, it is to your prophet to remove the word Bible from your vocabulary, I believe. I'm all about distinction, okay? You might say, I'm causing strife. Bible is not in the scriptures. Scriptures in the, is in the scriptures. Uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, refer to it as the lowercase w word of God. But Bible is not in the scripture. Bible is a, correction, a collection of books. A Bible is an NIV. And, and yes, yes, this even says Holy Bible. Yes, it does. Okay? Yes, it does. But within the context, it doesn't say Bible. But you look on, in the Bibles at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'll, I'll leave a link. Three, which one is included, the scriptures. Only three out of a multitude of the versions that I have looked into. Three, keep the word study. The scriptures, the authorized version, the amplified of all versions, translations, excuse me, and the Dewey Reams. Those are the ones that I have seen that keep study in verse 15 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The majority of them say, be diligent, work hard to show, your, to show yourself approved to God and None of them, except the scriptures, none of them mention rightly dividing the word of truth. I'll, I'll put the link for BibleHub.com with uh, the verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, okay? There might be some rogue translation out there that has study and rightly divide that I'm unaware of, but what I have looked at, they don't, they don't mention 
rightly dividing. It's always handling the word of God correctly, not deceitfully. Handling the word of God rightly, blah, 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 not rightly dividing. Okay. See, God wants you to study what? The word of truth and rightly divide it. Satan, through his Bibles, wants you to do work well and to make sure you handle the word of God rightly according to what spirit, though? See, see, only, only, only the authorized version of the scriptures tells you to study and to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay. Like I said, I didn't. I don't have time to look in every single translation. Okay, I don't know about the MEV or some of these other weird ones out there. Okay, but see, God is not the author of confusion. Okay, but God's word is the only one that tells you to rightly divide the word of truth. And some will be like, "Well, that just means divide the Bible from the Quran, or the Catechism, or the Book of Moron." No. Because why? Because then that's ascribing onto the Quran and the Catechism and the Book of Moron of what? Word of truth? No. No. The Quran, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and the Book of Moron, those are just examples. They are not the word of truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, John 17, 17. Thy word, lowercase w, written word, is truth. So the scriptures tell us to rightly divide the word of truth. What does that mean? Being dispensational or other ages, which uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 6. We touched on those in the uh, two previous videos before this one, so we're not going to get into that, but I'm going to link the two previous videos in this one and also the one coming, Lord willing, okay? But in other ages other dispensations, other times, okay? We are to rightly divide the word of truth, okay? What happens today is a lot of people take something from like the dispensation of the law, like all these prophetic heretics, okay? Like to take things from under the dispensation of the law and make them viable for today. That's not the way it works, okay? Heresy, okay? Or they, they like to take the works and bring it in today for this dispensation. Heresy. They talk about that in Acts chapter 15, okay? Where the, the Judaizers were saying, uh, it's necessary to have them circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved or stay safe. No, 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 no. Okay? No. No. You have to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. If you don't, it says right there, God will be ashamed of you. Why? Because you're taking something from another dispensation and trying to make it viable for this dispensation. God doesn't work that way in this dispensation as he did in another. Most of the heresies that you are going to, most of them, of the heresies that you are going to run into today are people not rightly dividing the word of truth, trying to take something that was viable for another dispensation and trying to make it viable for today. <laughs> not happening. Okay? So, Let's get into this, okay? That's, that's a short introduction. We have a lot to go through, okay? Hey, you. I'm not concerned about how much time you have, okay? If you could sit there and watch a Hollywood movie, The Lord of the Rings, okay? But you don't want to uh, engage in searching the scriptures? I'm not concerned about your time. Okay? Um, piecemeal it, if you must. Okay? I'm not concerned about how much time you have. I understand. Uh, man's attention span is that of an act. I understand that. But you know what? You need to search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so, my dear friend. Okay? So, without further ado, let's get to it. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 2. This is the easiest and the most, this is the easiest dispensation to expound upon. Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis means beginning, okay? The very first dispensation of all of Scripture and all of man, 
The very first dispensation. What is the very first dispensation? The Garden of Eden. Okay? And in the Garden of Eden, where man created where God created man, and man named everything and whatnot, and man uh, tended the garden and stuff like that. Remember, uh, man was not made just to be a gardener, okay? We talked about that before. But the first dispensation. What were the conditions of the first dispensation? The first dispensation, there was no sin. Okay, man was made perfect. Man had pristine relationship with God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. They saw God, okay? They saw God. This was before the fall, okay? So at the beginning, man was perfect without sin. They only knew God, okay? They only knew God. There was no sin there. And there was only one good, but who? God. So they only knew what good was, and that is God, okay? And what were the conditions of this dispensation? People, these heretics like the easy believism, uh, non-dispensational, hyper-dispensational heretics like to say, in the Garden of Eden, there was faith alone. Really? They're lying to you. Prove it to you. Absolutely. Okay. Genesis chapter 2. What were the conditions of this? Verses 15 on to verse 17. Here are the conditions of the very first dispensation of Scripture. Okay. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Go ahead. It's yours. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. You see that one? Go ahead. Eat that. You see that one? Go ahead. Okay. But, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat it. Eat of it. Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay? So, that's very simple, isn't it? God said unto the man, Adam, okay? And remember, you can make a very valid argument that at the beginning man was created vegan. Okay? Because there's no sin. Every tree of the garden and, and every herb bearing seed. You can make a valid argument that man was created vegan. You can make that valid argument. Okay? But, very simple. Verses 15, uh, what was this? Uh, verses 15 on to verse 17 shows us the conditions of this very first dispensation. All this. All this you can even, but see that tree right over there? Don't touch that one. You, you can have all this. It's all yours. Don't, don't eat from this one. Don't eat from this one. He doesn't say touch it, by the way. He doesn't say touch it. He says don't eat from it. Okay. Eve adds don't touch. Okay. She added to the word of God. He said, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay. That's called a condition. That's called a work. Okay? Because if you eat of that, you're going to die. Hence, if you leave it alone and just eat everything else, you're going to be okay. But if you do what I said not to do, you're going to die. That's called a work. That's called a condition. Okay? There's no faith involved there. Oh, don't worry. We're going to get in. We're going to get into this a little deeper. Okay, but that is the first condition of the first dispensation. All this you can have. All of that. Just don't eat that one. Okay. Look at all that you have to choose from. Go find it. But leave this one alone. And what does Satan do? Okay. What does Satan do? Satan comes along in Genesis chapter three. And we're going to be now, we're going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 8. Satan comes along. Okay? Um, Satan and Lucifer are one and the same. Okay? You get these devils who are saying that there are two entities. No, there's, there's only one. 
Okay, Satan. Satan, Lucifer, son of the morning, not light bearer, okay? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 on verse 8. Now the serpents, that old devil, Satan, talks about in the book of Revelation chapter 12, I believe that is, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Satan is a created being. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, questioning what God has said. Hence, every heretic, every pagan idolater out there, yea, hath God said, question what God has said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. He never said, neither shall ye touch it. You look right across the page there at verse 17. Find me where he said, thou shalt not uh, touch it. Okay, he didn't say that. Eve added to the word of God. Okay. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. We, we have expounded on this plenty of times before, okay? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. <laughs> and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So see, that's what Satan does. The one thing God tells you to leave alone, Satan is going to go to that and make it look so pretty and gorgeous. Sin, okay? An example, sodomy. Sodomy is sin. God hates it, okay? God hates it. But Satan comes along and makes sodomy look so beautiful and tempting, huh? Like all these harlots that you see on television and stuff like that, and you know, Making you making men drool and women drool over these men and women on television, all these with their fake looks and whatnot. Okay, Satan will take that which God says not to do and dress it up to make it look so beautiful to tempt you to go against what God said. Like I've given the analogy before, you know, the red button thing. Like you can make sure, you know, you can touch all those red buttons, all those buttons, but that one red button that is in the middle of that council, don't touch it or else you're going to let the, the nuke go. And because of our fallen nature as man, our flesh immediately because of this, you want to touch that red button. You want to go after that thing because it stems from this, see, okay? And uh, Satan says, the serpent says in verse 4, ye shall not surely die. Uh, they did die. Not instantaneously, which Satan was playing off of. Okay? See, they thought oh, in verse 17, thou shalt surely die. They thought, drop dead instantly. No. Man was originally created immortal. Vegan and immortal. Yeah. Okay? To live forever. It was a gradual process. Adam lived a thousand years, okay, or 999 years or something like that, okay? Lived a long time. He didn't die gradually, but see, man was created to not die. But see, Satan comes along, says, You won't die? Not instantaneously, no. He, he was right. He was right, not, not right away, no, but eventually you will. It's going to catch up to you. Your sin will find you out. Okay? Let's continue. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, they only knew what good was. And Satan comes along and says, Hey, you eat that, you disobey, you do what God said not to do, then you'll be able to judge what is good and evil, because they only knew what was good. But here, Satan's coming along tempting not at gunpoint, tempting to do evil and disobey what God said. See, that's a work. It's a work. There's no faith involved. God said, don't. Satan comes along and says, God really say that? Go ahead. Look at how beautiful it is. Okay? 
and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Man at the beginning of creation only knew what was good. But since they disobeyed, now they know what is evil. Hence, we have a book, the scriptures, which tells us what is good and evil. Why do you think Satan messes with it? Let's continue. And like I just said, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, looked good, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, ah, like all sin, Satan makes it look good to your eyes, doesn't he? Yeah. And a tree to desire to and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. They knew they were naked. And going down to verse... Uh, Going down to verse 8, uh, let's, let's continue reading here, okay? And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. How does a voice walk unless he has a body? Adam and Eve saw God. They had a pristine, perfect relationship with God. But they disobeyed. Okay? And not at gunpoint, but they disobeyed. Hence, Sin was brought in, and they knew what was evil when they had only knew what was good. Okay, They saw God and had pristine relationship with him. That was altered, because ye have God said. Remember, Satan didn't force Eve to do so. Okay, But they disobeyed. Okay, Now, in the same chapter, go now to verses 22 on to verse 24. Okay? Verses 22 on to verse 24. Those were the conditions of the very first dispensation. Works. Okay? There was no faith involved. We looked at Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. They saw God. Okay? God was walking in the cool of the garden. Okay? How does a voice walk unless he has a body? Okay? Adam and Eve saw God. He said, don't eat from the tree. Satan comes along, tempts them. They eat from the tree, disobey, bring in sin. Okay? The first dispensation was clear works. There was no faith involved. Okay? You get these heretics telling you, it was faith alone from death. They're lying to you. There is no faith involved. They could see God. You don't need faith when you can see him. Do you understand? Okay? So, they disobey. And of course, um, an animal had to die because the Lord, uh, where does he say, where he, um, where he, uh, da, da. yeah, in verse 21. And unto, and on, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So, an animal had to die in order to clothe them. Okay, I've run into people it's like, well, God could have miraculously taken the skins off. And so what? So God's this barbaric butcher who's going to skin an animal alive and leave the animal alive skinned? No, no. Animals had to die in order to clothe Adam and Eve. Just bring that up. But verses 22 now on to verse 24. The conditions were works, no faith. They blew it. That was, those were the conditions. How did this dispensation end? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth 
from the Garden of Eden to till the ground, from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So that is how that dispensation ended. The first dispensation in Scripture was works only. God said, don't eat from the tree. Look, look at all this, okay? You have all that to choose from. Limitless. Limitless choices. Just don't eat that tree. And Satan comes along and says, no, eat that tree. Never mind, oh, there must be something special about that. They disobey. They bring in sin because now they know it is evil because they disobeyed. Hence, they get booted out of the garden. An animal had to die to skin the skin to clothe them. Hence, end of the very first dispensation. The very first dispensation was determined by works. Man was made right with God. How? By works. Don't eat of the tree. Okay? That, that is what determines a dispensation. How is man made right within the said dispensation? Okay? Grace is in every dispensation. We just looked at God's grace in the very first dispensation. He clothed them with skins from animals. Okay? That was God's grace. Clothed them, but kicked them out. See, God, if God's grace wasn't in every dispensation, we'd all go up whoop, like a puff. Okay? How a man is made right within the said dispensation is what determines a dispensation. Because there are some that say that from, okay, the Garden of Eden unto Noah, that's the second dispensation. And then the third dispensation is uh, from Abraham to the law. I don't, I personally don't teach that. You'll see people disagreeing, by the way, with what dispensation is what dispensation. Okay, you're going to see that. Like I said, I believe and teach seven dispensations, okay? Any more, any less, uh, you're really to look at someone uh, with suspicion, okay? And of course, if someone is, in, is like the whole of uh, Scripture uh, men's together, get away from them. Like these new F IFB guys, you know, they're the ones who taught, did that thing about uh, debunking dispensationalism, heretics, okay? Heretics. Like I said, you're going to see people disagree. For example, like I said, there are some out there who believe that from the garden to Noah, that's the second dispensation. I don't believe or teach that. You also have some celebrity preachers who believe, believe and teach that the fourth dispensation is the three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ. I don't believe or teach that at all. I vehemently disagree with that. So you are going to see people disagree with what dispensation is what dispensation. Okay. All you need to really remember is what dispensation you are in and how man is made right with God in that dispensation. Okay? And you'll be right. And you'll be doing good. Okay? But that was the end of the first dispensation. First dispensation works. No faith involved because they could see God. Okay? Works. They disobey. Boom! They get kicked out. Okay? And an animal had to die. An animal had to die in order to clothe them. First dispensation works. Okay? How did it end? With them getting kicked out. Okay? Now the second dispensation. The dispensation of the patriarchs. Okay? The patriarchs. Genesis chapter 4. Verses 1 on to verse 7. Okay? Very telling. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruits of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the fat firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance, his body, body, visage, face, countenance, his body language, you could say, okay? And his countenance fell, 
And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou do well, if thou do well, do well. Remember that. Shalt thou not be accepted? Remember that. Because this dispensation, the time of the patriarchs, easy believism, devil heretics like to say that it's exactly the same today as it was in this dispensation. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We're going to get into this, okay? But, verse 7, if thou do well, thou sh shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, because you want to touch that big red button. Okay? And thou shalt rule over him. And of course, let's read verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. If thou do well. Now, let's first look at this. Cain. Cain. What about Cain? Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. This, this is imperative to understand this within this dispensation, okay? James chapter 3. We want verses 13 on to verse 18, okay? James, an epistle for the Hebrews during the time for the time of Jacob's trouble. We'll get into that in the next video. James chapter 3, verses 13 on to verse 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 on to verse 18. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge amongst you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But... If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, like Cain did, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, led by the senses, devilish. An offering of the fruit of the ground. Okay? Anyone could have taken fruit. And here... Giving it to the Lord. Okay? Okay, keep that in mind. Let's continue. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And did not Cain slew, uh, slew Abel? Yeah, he did. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Okay? And now go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. That's XI if you're using a facsimile copy. Hebrews chapter 11. One verse. Verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. He offered him of the first sling, also synonymous with uh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? Okay? See, Cain offered things of the earth, earthly things. Okay? Good fruits, yes, but he offered them things of the earth. Well, uh, Abel, Abel offered of his flock. Okay? Living, breathing, bleeding. Okay? Hence, God had respect unto that, typifying um, how God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay? And go to 1 John now, chapter 3, just a couple of one verse mentions here. 1 John chapter 3, okay? 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. 
not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. That doesn't mean that Satan was his daddy. No, it does not. The serpent seed doctrine is heresy, okay? Put a link in the description box for that. One second, let me write that down. Okay. 1 John chapter 3, verses 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Yes. Yes. The firstling of his uh, flock denotes the beloved, the choice, the best. When Cain took just, you know, he could have picked up something from off the ground, you know, rotten fruit even. But he took, you know, just anybody could have done that. Okay. It, it shows that, yes, maybe the fruit was good and luscious and pleasing to the eye, but it wasn't the firstling. See. Okay, go back to Genesis chapter 4 now, okay? Genesis chapter 4. Okay, that's significant. That's significant. That's very significant to remember in this, especially when the, talking about this specific uh, dispensation, okay? Okay? Uh, verse 2. Uh, oh, no, uh, verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord from the earth, earthly things, okay, of the ground. We don't know what kind of fruit that was, but see, it shows a little laziness on Cain's part, okay. But, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, the firstlings, the first fruits, okay, you could say, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain could have been like, do you know what I went through to pick up all this fruit? To get all this? And you just... What about Abel? What about Abel? Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. This is a little rabbit trail that is uh, imperative to remember when uh, discussing this dispensation, okay? Because this dispensation is, uh, the dispensation of the patriarchs is similar to this dispensation that we have today, but different. Because what they were focusing their faith upon is what God will do. Where today, it has finished, okay? But more on that in a little bit. Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 under the close of the chapter. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts, the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Kind of like the hatred Cain had when he slew his brother. Yeah. Variance emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Hmm. All tell tale of who? Cain. Envyings, murderers, like Cain. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk, after, walk in the Spirit. 
Let us not be desirous of, of vainglory, provoking one another, envying another, one another. And see, that typifies the offerings of Cain and Abel. While Cain offered the fruit of the ground, it was a fleshly work. While Abel, the firstling of his flock, and the fat thereof, well, yes, you still will bread, that's fleshly, no, but that denotes giving of the best thereof, spiritual, okay? See, the fruit of the ground, of the ground, earthly, sensual, devilish, the firstlings of the flock, God shall provide himself a lamb. And under the dispensation of the law, you are to provide the best thereof, the firstlings of the flock, for certain uh, sacrifices, okay? See, it works together, okay? Cain's offering was done um, out of self, while Abel was self-sacrifice, giving of the best thereof, okay? You see? That's, that's very important to note. That's why we looked in Galatians here. And of course, go to Matthew chapter 23 now. Matthew chapter 23. Not Mark. And that is XXIII. For those of you using a facsimile copy. Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 and 35. <clears throat> Wherefore... Behold, I send unto you prophets and wit and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the righteous blood from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Archias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And see, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, like Cain, because they do all their outward adornments to be seen of men, works of the flesh, they bring in the fruit of the ground. Wherefore, as Cain, as Cain, they have that hatred, and, slew, and, sl and they slay their own brethren. Okay? And the Lord calls Abel righteous. Okay? Very important. And also, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Okay. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 5 on to verse 8. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Cain was carnally minded. While Abel was spiritually minded. Okay? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And of course, in that dispensation, the spirit of God was not a permanent uh, resident in anybody. Okay? Different dispensation. We looked at this to compare the two. Cain was carnal. Abel was spiritual. Okay? Okay, that's why we looked at that. And of course, Galatians chapter 4. Just one verse in Galatians chapter 4. Okay? Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. One verse. Verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, even so it is now. Cain, who was carnally minded. Abel, who was spiritually minded. Cain slew Abel. Today, those of us who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, have God living within us. Those who are fake, Persecute us who are real. Okay? Okay? You see? 
Now go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Verses 9 on to verse 18. How was man made right in this dispensation? Okay? How was man made right in this dispensation? And the dispensation of the patriarchs. Verse 7 in Genesis chapter 4. Remember this. If thou do well. Okay? If, there, if thou do well. Okay? Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay? If thou do well. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 on to verse 18. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sem, it says here in the authorized version here in the 1611 but Shem, or Sem, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Cain's line, which I believe and teach, was exterminated in the flood. Check out the Serpent Seed video. It will be in the description box, okay? Cain's line was exterminated in the flood, but yet sin was in man, okay? We cover that in the Serpent Seed do uh, Doctrine video, okay? The, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. If thou doest well, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. So he said unto him to make an ark of gopher wood. Okay, let's continue reading. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Oh, God is very specific, isn't he? Yes, he is. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower second and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. Okay? So, God said to Noah, build an ark, okay, if you do well. What God will do, what was God going to do? He was going to destroy the earth. So God said unto Noah, build an ark. What did Noah do in response to that? Verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. If thou doest well, God said to Noah, Build an ark. God, very specific about his ark. And God told him, you know, build the ark. And Noah built the ark. Okay? He believed what God said. Yes, he did. That God was going to bring a flood. That God was going to bring a flood upon the earth. Okay? So, Noah believed what God had said about him going to uh, bring a flood upon the earth. God commanded him, build an ark. God said, I'm going to destroy all the flesh, okay? Noah believed what God said and did according to what God had said, okay? He did well, all right? 
All right. Now go to Genesis chapter 12. See, it was what God was going to do. Noah did well, according to God, because he obeyed God. Okay. And Noah found grace in the eyes of God. All right. So Noah did well because of God, what God commanded him to do. Okay. And Noah obeyed what God had commanded him to do because Noah believed what God had said that God was going to, will do, bring a flood. Do you get it? Okay. Hence the difference between the dispensations. Okay. Okay. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Verses 1 on to verse 5. Okay. God said to Noah, build an ark. I'm going to destroy the earth. He destroys the earth in a flood. Then he makes a covenant with Noah. and says, go populate the earth. Okay. How man was made right in this dispensation didn't change with the flood. Because God said to Noah, build an ark because I'm going to destroy everything. God believed what Noah, oh God, uh, excuse me, Noah believed what God had said and he did. Okay. He believed, oh wow, you're going to destroy everything. Okay. I, you're going to do this. So he acted upon it. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 5. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will, I will shew thee. Okay, are, are you getting this? Okay, if thou doest well, okay, if thou doest well, okay. The line of Cain was destroyed in the flood, all right, okay. Noah, spiritual, Noah, spiritual, Abram, spiritual, okay. Yeah, he struggled with carnality, but big time. Yes, he does. Yes, he did. But Noah was told by God to do something. He was warned by God what was coming. And Noah believed everything God said and did what God said. And hence, okay, how man was made right in this dispensation was unaltered, okay, by Noah's flood. Because right here, Abram, the Lord says unto Abram, Get thee out, okay? Noah, get out. You know, you're going to be saved by the ark, being in the ark, a type of Christ, okay? Abram, get out from among them and be ye separate. Calling someone out from something, okay? Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will, what he will do, Shoo thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Very similar to Noah. And Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So right there, God said unto Abram, get out unto some... Did you see the I wills? How many I wills are in there? I will in verse 1. Uh, I will in verse 2. I will in verse 2. I will in verse 3. Okay? I will. I will. Okay? I will. I will. I will. All right. Um, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Now, okay. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 on to verse 6. 
After these things, the, the word of the Lord, we, we covered this in the previous videos, but we have to cover it here. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my, in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, towards heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Still, Lord, uh, the Lord is promising Abraham something that he will do. Okay? What he will do. And what were we reading to? Verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. See, in this dispensation, just like Noah, Abram believed what God had said he was going to do. And because he believed in what he said God was going to do, he acted upon that belief. See, the faith in what they were having is what God would do. After the flood, repopulate the earth, what God will do. The land that you see, I will give to thy seed, what God will will do to the land that I will shew thee. Okay? Okay? In this dispensation, the time of the patriarchs, okay, it was faith in what God will do. Okay? Your faith in what, he, the faith was in what he was going to do. And remember, the law was not given yet. Okay? There were no sacrifices for sins being made. There were sacrifices made. Yes, there were, but not according to the law because the law was not given. Yes, the law was written in man's hearts. We've talked about that before, okay? But see, in this dispensation, it was what God will do. In this today's dispensation, it is finished. Your faith is upon our Lord Jesus Christ, upon the finished work of the cross. What God has done, salvifically, okay? Okay, do you see? Do you see? And also, again, go, go back. I made, made mention of this. Uh, Genesis 22. Genesis uh, 22, XXI, verse 8. And Abraham, and Abraham said, My son, God will... Provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And of course, in the context, there was a, a ram caught in the thicket. But this is this is truly prophetic, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay, prophetic. Okay, fulfilled with Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay. Okay, you get, you get that? Now, Genesis chapter 17, uh, 5, 6, 7, verses 1 on verse 8. Okay? Again, what he will do. All right? All right? These guys had to have faith on our Lord that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. Today, in this dispensation, your faith has to be on Jesus Christ that what he did on the cross pays for your sin, okay? You have faith on him to forgive you your sin because you come to him broken of your self-righteousness, sorry because it's your fault, and in fear of him, you call upon his name and he save you, and you are trusting upon him that what he has done, that he has saved you, okay? That's the difference between the discipline, and not to mention, of course, in the time of the patriarchs, there was no permanence of the Holy Ghost. Okay? 
There was no seal until the day of redemption. No permanent residence within. Okay, in the very first dispensation. Uh, excuse me, in this the second dispensation. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Okay. Now, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 on to verse 8. Okay. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And here, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Okay? And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. What does Abraham mean? For a father of many nations have I made thee. And of course, our, our apostle for today, well, the apostle Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 4, okay? And Abraham's seed, I'll link that in the description box. Hold on one second. Let me write that down so I don't forget it. Okay, one second. Okay, okay. Verse 6. And I will. Did we read verse 5? Yes, we did. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will. I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. And I will. Are you catching the I wills? That is synonymous for the dispensation of the patriarchs. I will. I will. Okay? The dispensation of the patriarchs. After the Garden of Eden onto the giving of the law. Okay? First dispensation is the Garden of Eden. Second dispensation is the time of the patriarchs. Okay? Okay? And how is one made right with God? Trusting on the Lord and what he will do and acting on your trust on him of what he will do. Noah in the ark, getting uh, Abraham, Abram, who would, right here became Abraham, getting out, trusting in the Lord and what he will do. Okay? Okay? Similar to today, but different. Okay? Don't let these easy believism heretics fool you. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 7, and I will, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I will, I will, I will. Do you see that? Do you see that? Please tell me you do. I know you do. I know you do. You, you have to. You have to see that. Okay? Hence, again, the dispensation of the patriarchs. God said to Noah, build an ark because I'm going to destroy everything. Noah believed what God said, and he acted on that belief, believing what God said is going to happen. Noah, okay? Noah, God said, hey, get out of here unto a land that I will show thee. And we read, God, uh, Abraham believed God, and God accounted that to him for righteousness because Abraham believed, number one, what God said, and number two, believed what God will do, Okay? That's what it was like. That's how a man was made right in this dispensation, the time of the patriarchs. Okay? And Hebrews chapter 11. And it is written like this in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 for the time of uh, Jacob's trouble because after this dispensation is over and once the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble get it, they're going to go to the book of Hebrews and the book of James to realize what they've missed. And hence, they're going to have to have faith that God will do, that he will come back to be their king during the time of Jacob's trouble. But see, during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. Getting ahead of ourselves, we'll, we'll expound on that plenty in the next video, okay? But, 
Hebrews chapter 11. Okay? You, you mustn't be afraid of going to the book of Hebrews. You got to remember, a majority of it doctrinally is not for us today. Yes, it's in the New Testament. Yes, it is. And there are things that cross dispensational lines. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. But see, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about someone losing their uh, salvation and not getting it back. How does that jive for today? It doesn't. Why? Because the book of Hebrews is specifically written for the Jews, the Hebrews, during the time of Jacob's trouble. There are things that cross dispensational lines. Yes, there are. Okay? But you got to remember, the book of Hebrews and the book of James are time of Jacob's trouble epistles. While there are doctrines that cross dispensational lines, yes, much instruction in righteousness, you got to be careful with doctrine within them. Okay? But Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 on to verse 10. Okay? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And see, during the time of Jacob's trouble, this is going to be more applicable. Okay? By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Okay? Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Isaac and Jacob, the Hebraic line, okay? Which descends from Shem, okay? For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, Trusting God and what they couldn't see. Okay? We, today we walk by faith. Yes. Not by sight. Yes. But the difference is our faith is in what? It is finished. It wasn't finished during the dispensation of the patriarch. Patriarchs. You wicked, easy believism devils. Similar to today, but different totally different okay and while we're here in hebrews uh let's look at verses 13 and verse 16 these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth for they that say such things plainly declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So, the conditions... The conditions of the second dispensation, the conditions of it were what? Were what? Faith in what God will do and acting on that faith in what God will do, which we just examined in the book of Hebrews and in the chapters in the book of Genesis that we looked at, okay? That was synonymous. And also, you can look at Isaac, okay? He, and uh, I will be with thee and shew thee these things and do these unto, the, unto you. I will. Jacob, okay? I will be with thee. It's, it was, I will. What I will do, okay? That is what made the second dispensation. That is how 
people were made right with God in the second dispensation. Okay? Similar to today. But see, it wasn't finished. It wasn't finished. He was going to establish what? The law. The law was coming. That's the third dispensation. But the second dispensation, after the dispensation of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden was works. The dispensation of the patriarchs, yes, by faith, but also there was an element of works there. Okay? The faith was in what God will do, and they acted on what God will do. Okay? Also, that is similar in, in the dispensation of the law. But see, totally different say, uh, dispensation. Okay? Totally dispensation. So, one was made right in the dispensation of the patriarchs by having faith in what God will do and obedience upon that faith of what God will do. That is testified throughout the entire dispensation of the patriarchs. Okay? That's how men were made right in that dispensation. Similar to ours today, but totally different. How did the dispensation of the patriarchs end? Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. How did the dispensation of the patriarchs end? Exodus chapter 12. We will be reading verses 29 on to verse 36. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. A lot of people died. Yeah. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne. See, the firstlings, remember? Remember? Abel? Okay? The firstling? The significance of the firstling? And here, the Lord is killing all the firstlings Firstborns of Egypt. Okay? The Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where one was not, where there was not one dead. Yeah. Yeah. Death. Like an animal was slain to cover them. And in this, the end of the second dispensation, death of the firstborn. Yeah. Yeah. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, excuse me, and said, Rise up and get you forth from amongst my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as he hath said. Also take your flocks and your herds as he hath said, and be gone. And bless me also. How so? Uh, by getting out. It's like, get out of here. Okay? And what are we reading to? Verse 36. And the Egyptians were very, were urgent, excuse me, urgent upon the people that they might send them out to the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. And of course, this is fulfillment of prophecy. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Hence, the exodus, when our Lord smote all the firstborn in Egypt, that was the official end of the dispensation, big part, of the time of the patriarchs. Okay? So, the first dispensation, pure works, no faith involved. Second dispensation, faith in what the Lord will do and obedience upon that faith of what he will do. Okay? 
Now the third dispensation. The first dispensation ended with them getting kicked out of the uh, Garden of Eden. An animal had to die to clothe them with uh, skins. Second dispensation ended with the Exodus, the firstborn of Egypt. The third dispensation, the dispensation of the law, which many of the heretics of today like to take things from that this dispensation of the law and carry them over to today. How do you sum up the dispensation of the law? How do you sum it up? Okay. Exodus chapter 15. Verses 23 on to verse 26. Now you got to remember, in the dispensation of the patriarchs, that was on to men individually. But see, under the law, these were given on to a nation. And if anyone wanted to be right within this dispensation of the law, you had to do what was written in the law. Okay? Exodus chapter 15, verses 23, on to verse 26. Now, uh, 15, okay? Am I reading uh, one second, brethren? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, Genesis, uh, Genesis, Exodus chapter 15, verses 23, on to verse, Exodus chapter 15, verses 23, on to verse 26. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord shewed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And he said, If, circle if, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, his commandments and keep all his statutes. Okay? I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. How do you sum up the dispensation of the law? Uh, verse 26. Verse 26. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Leviticus chapter 17. Not 20. Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter five, 10, 5, 6, 7. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 on to verse 11. Now remember in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay? He doesn't do that until Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? These easy believers and heretics will tell you and teach you that the animal sacrifices were objects of faith. No, it was a requirement for what? Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 on to verse 11. Okay? Genesis, uh, Leviticus, I'm sorry. The, 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 the numeral, the Roman numeral thing is throwing me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I don't use this uh, as often as I should, so... <laughs> Leviticus 17, verses 10 and 11. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the faith that maketh an atonement for the soul. Huh? Are you looking at that? It's the blood. Or should I say it's the flesh? No, it's the blood. It's the blood. Animal sacrifices brought in now during, under the law to cover, not to wash away, to cover sin, not to do away with it, because they were continual animal sacrifices. Why? Because of Leviticus chapter 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay? Now, Deuteronomy chapter 27, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 27, okay? And that's double X, five, six, seven, V-I-I, verses 14 on to verse 26 in Deuteronomy chapter 27, okay? And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that sitteth like by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. We're in Leviticus chapter 27. We are reading on to verse 26, the close of the chapter. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife. Eh. Doesn't say his mother, even though that is forbidden in Scripture, obviously. But this is encompassing also stepmother, okay? Not your mother, but your father's wife, get it, okay? So there's no loopholes, okay? Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. You might say, well, what about Abraham? The gene pool was pure at that time, more pure still. Okay, but now it is written in the law. No, no. Yes, there was incest uh, before the law. Yes, there was, because you got to remember, too, the gene pool of man was not as diluted and as corrupt as it has become, gradually become, okay? So, yes, there was. But see, after this, strictly forbidden in Scripture, okay? God has purposes for everything, okay? <clears throat> Yes, uh, verse 23. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Verse 26. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Okay? All right? Under the dispensation of the law, you had to keep the law in order to be right with God. Your faith was in that God would honor your sacrifices that you would make according to to the law so you would have faith that God would honor you be honor you and forgive you and all that kind of stuff because you did what he said in the law okay the animal sacrifices you wicked satanic heretics 
were not objects of faith. No, they were required, according to the law, to cover, for, uh, to cover sin, to make atonement, okay, to cover it. But they had to continually do it, see. That's why the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanseth away all sin, while the blood of bulls and of goats, bulls and goats, covered, okay? The blood of bulls and goats covered. The blood of God cleanseth away, see. Because they had to continually offer them, not as objects of faith. That's ridiculous. That's heresy. That's lunacy. Okay? Totally disproven by Scripture. Okay? They had to do the animal sacrifices. Okay? So, the law was brought in. Under the dispensation of the law, a man was made right with God by what? Faith and works. Faith that God would honor the works that you do according to his law and statutes that he gave you. Okay? That's how one was made right in the dispensation of the law. Faith and works. Not pure works. Like in the first dispensation. Because you could they didn't see God like they did in the first dispensation. Not like the dispensation of the patriarchs because there was no law given yet. Okay? It was what God will do. And God was establishing the law and the nation here. Okay? And here's the thing, too, about the dispensation of the law. Okay? God spoke through three, three avenues. Priest, prophet, and king. Yeah, Church of the Living God, brother, sister. Yeah, priest, prophet, and king. Oh, who, who, who fulfills all three of those? Yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ, God, our Father. After the order of Melchizedek. Yes, of course. Priest, prophet, and king. God spoke through priest, prophet, and king during this dispensation. Okay? Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 44. Okay? One second, brethren. Beg your pardon. Ezekiel chapter 44. Okay? A good summation here of um, how it is under the law. Okay? And remember, Ezekiel was a prophet. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 44, we want verses 23 and 24. Okay? And in controversies, they, the priests, shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves, but for father or for, oh, excuse me, I, I we excuse me, verses 23 on to verse 24. I didn't read verse 23. Beg your pardon, okay? Let's do this again. Ezekiel 44, verses 23 on to verse 24. The priests, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause men to discern between the unclean and the clean. The function of the priest. The priest also did the animal sacrifices, okay? And did the shedding of blood and the sprinkling of stuff like that. But also the priest was what? And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause men to discern between the unclean and the clean. Let's read verse 24 again. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment and they shall judge it according to my judgments and they shall keep my laws and my statutes in, in all mine assemblies and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. So the priest, they did the works of the sacrifices, the sprinkling of blood and the killing of the heifer and the stuff like that and the incense, the offering of the shoe bread and whatnot. But they also taught the people the law. The truth, the statutes, okay? The function of the Old Testament Levitical scriptural priesthood, okay? And go to Malachi. More on this. Malachi. Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 7. Ezekiel that we looked at and Malachi are describing to you the function of priests, okay? 
uh, and Ezekiel and Malachi, the priests <laughs> went far away from, so they had to be reminded of what their function was, which is why we are looking at it today, right now, so we can know what it was like under the dispensation of the law. Okay? Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 under verse 7. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I, that I have sent this commandment unto you, that I may, that my covenant, excuse me, might be with Levi, Seth, the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my face, before my name, excuse me, excuse me, before my name, excuse me. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and iniquity and did turn many away from iniquity. Yes, because the priest is supposed to teach the law and teach the difference between the holy and profane. Okay? For the priest's lips should keep knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom, uh, uh, knowledge proceeds from wisdom. But wisdom and knowledge, they are two different things. You can have knowledge and have not wisdom. If you have wisdom, which is the fear of the Lord, you will have knowledge. Okay? Things that are different are not the same. They're two different things. Remember that. Okay? For the priest's lips should teach knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Okay? Seek the law, what God has said. Okay? So the function of the priest was to offer the sacrifices and teach the precepts of the law. Okay? For he was the, the God for our Lord's messenger. Yes, he was. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, God spake through priests, through the law, through the scriptures. Also, he spake through what? Prophets. Okay? Numbers, chapter 12. Numbers, chapter 12. Yes, we have to go back there yet again. Okay? Numbers, chapter 12. Numbers, chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. We covered this in the first uh, two previous videos, but Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. Okay? The prophet was the mouthpiece of the Lord. Like Elijah and Elisha. Before the Lord of hosts. Before whom I stand. The priests. The knowledge of what? The law. The knowledge of the Lord. And were to impart the statutes, the commandments, the judgments, the precepts, the testimonies and stuff like that. But the prophet was the mouthpiece, okay? The mouthpiece, the uh, uh, the, the the front man, if you will, okay? The one who did a lot of the warning, okay? Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. Not Zephaniah, <laughs> Hosea. Hosea is after Daniel. Hosea chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. O Ephraim, 
Hosea chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Remember that. Remember that. As the morning cloud it goeth away. Remember that. Remember that. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. You will you read the book of Haggai. Okay? The prophets were very stinging. The prophets stung the people when they diverted themselves away from the law. Okay? They diverted themselves away from the priests, from the statutes and commandments. The Lord would send a prophet. Hey! Hey! Hosea. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, okay? Okay? The Lord used prophets as his instruments, the prophets as his instruments of warning, correction, guidance, okay? Guidance, yes, okay? The priests taught the law, but the prophets were the ones who were, you know, giving the warning. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord could come upon someone under the Old Testament, and the Lord could use that man to be his mouthpiece, okay? While the priests had the commandments, the testimonies, and the statutes, yes, the prophet, the Spirit of the Lord would guide them, okay? Okay? You understand? And also on that, we're going to touch on that here in just a minute. We're just going to, we're going to touch on that in a minute. During this dispensation, during this dispensation, okay, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord could come upon people, okay? For example, you read about Samson, how the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and some of these prophets, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and how King Saul, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. See, under the law, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, would come upon people. Yes, he would. Yes, he would. And the Spirit of the Lord within that person would give utterance. Okay? The prophet would give utterance. Yes, in this dispensation. Okay? Yes, he would. The Lord and the Old Testament uh, law, under the law, he spake to the priests because they had the law through the prophets. Okay? His mouthpiece. His mouthpiece, like Elijah and Elisha, before the Lord God, before whom I stand. Okay? All right? And also through a king. Okay? Go to 1 Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Okay? 1 Samuel chapter 10. God also used judges. Okay? Yes, the book of Judges. Obviously, that was before a king was there. So, he operated through priest, prophet, judges, king. Okay? But we're, we're noticing that we're going to focus on the king. Okay? 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 on to verse 19. Okay? And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to mispet. And said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Okay? He gave them the law. He spoke through priest, through prophet, and in the book of Judges. Yes, he utilizes judges. Okay? But see, 
that wasn't enough for the children of Israel. They wanted to be like everyone else. So they wanted a king to rule over them. Okay? Second, uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6, on to verse 15 now. 1 Samuel 12, verse 6, on to verse 15. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord, of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought, you, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balim and Eshtroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve the Lord. And the Lord sent Jerabel, and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. And when ye saw, that he, now he was referring on to the judges, okay? Okay? Aaron the priest, Moses the prophet, okay? And also the judges, and now it leads on to the king, okay? So priest, prophet, Judges, kings. These are all avenues in which the Lord operated through. Okay? Yes. And yes, he himself did appear. Yes. Okay? You read about in the book of Joshua. Okay? Uh, he was the commander of the Lord of hosts. Yes. He made, you know, the, you know, what, what's that phrase? Amplipomorphic or something? Something like that? Yes, he did. Okay? But under the dispensation of the law, Priest, prophet, judge, and king. But the judges went ixnay for the kings. Okay? But see, the priest, the prophet, were still available, were still around, as well as the king. Okay? Because the time of the judges passed. The last judge over Israel was Samuel. Okay? He was the last judge before the king. So the office of the judges, scripturally, under the dispensation of the law, went defunct. Yes, there were judges, yes. But the judges in the context in which the Lord used them. No, no, okay? Let's continue. Verse 12. And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord was your king. The judges never, not one of them wanted to be, you won't call me a king. You won't call me a king. Abimelech, who wasn't a real judge, okay, attempted that. But, you know, uh, Jephthah, uh, uh, Gideon, it's like, I, I won't rule over you. The Lord will rule over you, okay? Okay? The Lord was their king. But see, they wanted a physical thing to look at. The Lord was happy to oblige. He was. He was. Because our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our King, will reign over them and over all eventually. Verse 14. Uh, uh, verse 13. Now therefore behold the King whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Verse 14. If ye will fear the Lord, and serve him, and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. 
But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. And when the children of Israel would rebel against the word of the Lord, against his commandments, the Lord would raise up prophets. Okay? You look in the context of the prophets. The prophets were raised up to bring the people back from, uh, from the law which they had gone away from. Okay? Hence the difference between the priest and the prophet. Okay? The prophet was like, hey, you've gone astray. Get back here, I'm going to hit you. Okay? All right? And see, like, like I said, in the dispensation of the law, the prophet, as we read in Numbers, the Lord would make himself known unto that prophet in a dream or a vision. Okay? And the Spirit of God would come upon that prophet, and he would prophesy in the Old Testament, giving future revelations. Okay? prophesying of things to come, okay? But see, the Spirit of the Lord in the dispensation of the law could come and go. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord, well, would come on people, yes, within the Old Testament, within the dispensation of the law, of the law. Yes, and also the Spirit of the Lord came upon the people in the camp or with Moses. Yes. But it wasn't a permanent he wasn't a permanent residence. The Spirit of the Lord could come and go dependent on what the person did. See, unlike today, when the Lord saves you, you are sealed permanently with the Holy Ghost. Once saved, always saved. In the dispensation of the law. Faith and works. Animal sacrifices. And faith that God will honor you because you have done according to the law an uh, animal sacrifice. Okay? And the Spirit of the Lord could come upon people. But if you messed up, the Spirit of the Lord would depart from them. Prove that to you. Oh, Gladly. Go to Judges. Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. That's X-V-I. Judges chapter 16. Just one verse. Okay? A couple of one verses for you. Judges chapter 16. Verse 20. Remember I mentioned about uh, Samson? How the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily? Right? Well, Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Beg your pardon, brother. And she said, Delilah, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Now that's because uh, Delilah cut off the dreadlocks that he had. But then again, um, Samson was a Nazarite and messed around with his calling. Okay, so the Lord departed from Samson because of what he did, because the, Delilah cut off his locks. He should never have been there in the first place. But you see that, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 oh! First Samuel, go to, back to First Samuel chapter sixteen. Almost open right to it. Thank you, Father. First <laughs> uh, Samuel chapter 16, one verse. Verse 14. King Saul, who also had the Spirit of the Lord come upon him mightily. <laughs> verse 14 in First Samuel chapter 16. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Wow. So not only did the Spirit of the Lord depart from Saul, but an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. One more. Psalm 51. Beg your pardon? Psalm 51, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
So you see, in the dispensation of the law, the holy, in the dispensation of the patriarchs, okay, um, the the Holy Ghost. Okay, and in the dispensation of the whole uh, of the patriarchs, you do not see, not to my recollection, the Holy Ghost coming upon people as you do see in the dispensation of the law. Okay, when he was operating through priest, prophet, and king. Remember, the office of judge went defunct when they got they established a king. Okay, but the Holy Ghost in the dispensation of the law could come and go, come and go. Eternal security was not there. Okay? Eternal security was not there in the time of the patriarchs because the permanent seal of the Holy Ghost was not there. Okay? Okay? Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness and Abraham acted on what God told him to do because he believed he was going to do what he was going to, what he said he was going to do, obviously, same with Noah, okay? But in the dispensation of the law, the Holy Ghost could come, upon, uh, could come upon someone, the Spirit of the Lord, but he wasn't a permanent resident. Wasn't a permanent resident. And see, because of that, because the seal of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost had not been given because of that. He could come and go, come and go. Hence, the Spirit of the Lord can go off of a prophet and then come on to a prophet. Hence, Old Testament prophets. Hence, you see these wicked people today saying the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. They are taking from the dispensation under the law where the Holy Spirit could come and go, come and go, and they're applying it for today doesn't work like that. That's how it did work in the dispensation of the law. See, these lying false prophets are deceiving you. They're taking something from another dispensation and bringing them into today's dispensation. God doesn't work like that. Okay? And you got to remember, we have to address this. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 8. Okay? What was the purpose of bringing in this law? Okay? What was the whole purpose of it? Okay? Why did God do that? Okay? Okay? Check this out. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 8. The conditions of the dispensation of the law was faith and works. Faith in the works that you would do according to the the law of God, and that he would uh, forgive and honor you for honoring what you did according to the law, okay? You had faith that God would honor you because you did what was according to the law, okay? Hence, faith and works in the dispensation of the law, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 8. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Remember, the law was given unto a nation. Yes, a nation. Yes, you got to remember that, okay? Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You had to keep the commandments to be right with God in the dispensation of the law, okay? Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, hmm. which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh on to them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? See, the children of Israel, under the dispensation of the law, were those called out to be an example unto the nations of a people that followed the Lord. See, okay? Similar in respect unto us of the church of the living God, okay? We've been called out of Egypt to be examples unto the lost of our Lord's mercy for us today, okay? We, we have not replaced the Jew, okay? Uh, going to be uh, videos on replacement theology within this video, okay, in the uh, description box, okay? But the Church of the Living God, which is comprised of Jew and Gentile, okay, the same principle. We are ambassadors for Christ as they were, as the Jew was to be under the dispensation of the law. But see, this is a different dispensation, okay? Do you see? And, and, it, and it's got to make you wonder, how are we being examples unto the Lord according to the scriptures by the Lord who lives in us permanently? Hmm? But, okay, so first dispensation, pure works. Second dispensation, faith in what God will do. Second dispensation, faith and works. The law is introduced. You got to shed blood to make uh, remission for sin, to cover sin, okay? And your faith is in God will honor you for doing the sacrifices by doing what was in the law. Your faith was in God that he would honor you because you did what God said according to the law. So faith and works. How did the dispensation of the law end? And remember, in the dispensation of the law... The Spirit of the Lord could come upon people, but he could come and go, come and go, come and go. There was no eternal security. There was no seal until the day of redemption. Not a permanent residence. Already proved that to you. How did this, the law, how did the dispensation end? How did the dispensation of the law end? Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9. Got to watch my time here. He, come on, fingers, work with me. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 on to verse 17. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called holiest of all, the holiest of all, excuse me, which had the golden censor and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron, Aaron's rod that budded and the ta tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak not which of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second when he went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Do you get that? Okay. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, which could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats 
and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of, the, of an heifer, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, he never sinned, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, not birth, death, For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So the dispensation of the law ended with the death of the testator. Okay? So when you read in the New Testament the gospel accounts before the death, burial, and resurrection, they were still doctrinally under the law, even though Christ was on the earth, okay? And yes, he had the power to forgive sins on earth. Yes, Christ as king was offering the kingdom of heaven, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, onto the Jews before the death, burial, and resurrection. They rejected that, okay? But see, while Christ was on the earth, the law was still binding. Why? Because sacrifice for the perfect sacrifice for sins was not made some like to tell you that the fourth dispensation is the three and a half year ministry of our lord jesus christ nonsense no why because the perfect sacrifice for sins was not yet made and they go to well can they can they uh fast while the bridegroom is uh is with them uh and stuff like that i understand that argument but still the overall thing was, number one, the inevitable rejection of the kingdom of heaven of the Jew and the inevitable going to the cross for our Lord Jesus Christ to die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood for the remission of sins. So that had not happened yet. So they were still under the law while Christ was still on the earth. Okay? As God... They're present. Yes, he could forgive sins. But then he said unto those, it's like, I forgive you, made you clean, but go do the offering that is commanded for, uh, of Moses for a testimony unto them. See, the law was still binding while our Lord Jesus Christ was on the earth. He fulfilled the law as pertaining unto the animal sacrifices. Because why? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. Okay? And Matthew chapter 11. Okay? Okay? Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, one verse. Verse 13. This is the one that uh, certain people go to. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Prophesied. Prophesied. But you, you go to Luke chapter 16 now. 
Yeah, yeah. Luke chapter 16 now, you're going to see something different. Luke 16, verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Hmm. So, what does that mean? The apostle, uh, John the apostle, John. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets before the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, was announced unto Israel. John was the old of uh, old, the last of the Old Testament prophets. The law and the prophets prophesied, gave warning, gave testimony. Where was that? Um, uh, where, 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 where was that? In Matthew chapter 11, what? <laughs> Verse 13, okay? For the prof, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, okay? The law would, you know, making mention of the eventual coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? You read about that in Deuteronomy, okay? You read about that in Deuteronomy. And John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lord, Okay, yes. So the law, for so the prophets and the law prophesied, spake of, until John. Why? Because here's the king, offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews. That doesn't mean that they were in some kind of a limbo state. Okay, no, that doesn't mean that. It means that the prophets and the law gave uh, prophesied, gave testimony. Until John, because John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. The law was still binding because Jesus Christ had not died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures yet. And he didn't shed his blood on the cross, okay? He was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, which they were going to reject. Hence, hence, still under the law. Hence, the fourth dispensation I do not believe at all was the three and a half year ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ because the law was still binding because the perfect uh, sacrifice had yet to be made. Okay? But with the death of the testator brings in what? This current dispensation. Go to Acts. Okay? First dispensation works. Second dispensation, faith in what God will do. Third dispensation, the dispensation of law, faith, and works. The works of the law. Fourth dispensation. Today, the time of the Gentiles. Grace through faith. Okay? By God's grace through faith. Okay? Not faith alone, but by God's grace. God's grace is what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You have to go to God on his terms, okay? Our faith is the response to his grace. And you know how he says in the book of John, it is finished? Our faith today in this dispensation is in the finished work of the cross upon our Lord Jesus Christ. It is finished. It's finished! Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He shed his blood on the cross. You come to him broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord you call upon his name. Scream out, call out, Lord, forgive me, save me. I repent, forgive me, and may he save you. Okay? And when he save you, he seals you. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. One second, brethren. All right. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 under verse 14. Uh, no, no, let's... Uh, no, 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 no. Let's begin at verse 4. Let's begin at verse 4. No, let's begin at verse 3. Excuse me. Never mind. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 14. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, 
of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When, the, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times and season, times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember, it begins in Jerusalem to the Jew first. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, okay, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Shimon Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Okay? So they were to wait until the what? The pouring out, the giving of the Holy Ghost, which happens in Acts chapter 2. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And you got to remember, which we address in the previous two videos, the sign gifts, the speaking in tongues, and stuff like that, and their men seeing dreams were all sign gifts for the Jews. Because remember, you read in First Corinthians chapter one, uh, what is it, verse twenty, verses twenty under verse twenty-four. The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay, so the sign gifts were there to confirm what the kingdom of God unto the Jews. And the sign gifts were depleted, went away after the book of Acts, okay? The sign gifts started to deplete after Acts chapter 7 because that's when Jewry as a nation rejected the gospel and us Gentiles were grafted in. We, we've, we've talked about that at length, okay? But the sign gifts were for the Jews. This is this current dispensation. Why? Because the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for sins was made. But see, God, who first offered the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, and they rejected it, okay, which is the physical, literal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, he had to offer, or else he wouldn't be a fair and just God, he had to offer the gospel, the kingdom of God, the spiritual, unto the Jew first. And they rejected it officially in Acts chapter 7. And then you see us Gentiles being grafted into that tree. Okay, it was the same dispensation. This dispensation of the time of the Gentiles. By grace through faith. But it had to go to the Jew first. Okay, all right. And the sign gifts, you wicked heretics, were for the Jews. And those sign gifts were about the apostles. Okay, and the sign gifts, like such as Cornelius, were signs for what? Jews. The sign gifts were for Jews. Today we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Sign gifts were visible signs for Jews. You lying, false, heretic prophets. I have dreamed. I have dreamed. No, you haven't. You are working for Satan. You're seeing visions from your father, the devil. Okay? But in this dispensation, unlike the other dispensation, the time of the law, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, okay? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 14, okay? Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. See, our faith is in what he has done. It is finished, okay? Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay? Permanently sealed. When you come to the Lord broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon the name of the Lord, okay, and he save you, the Holy Ghost comes upon you permanently. And see, these heretics, these prophetic heretics, uh, the Lord is upon me. The Lord gave me a bit. No, the Lord doesn't work like that anymore. Why? Because those who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you have God living within you. God doesn't have to, God doesn't operate through priest, prophet, and king. Okay? Why? Because God lives within you. Okay? And the spirit of truth, and the Lord is that spirit, the Holy Ghost, will guide you into all truth, people. So, the Old Testament prophet is defunct. Okay? There were those prophets in the book of Acts. Yes, but the book of Acts is a transition book. And after the book of Acts, dear friends, ah, uh, no more. The prophets today are not prophets. They are devils. Don't fall for that. But now, second uh, Ephesians chapter two, verses four and verse thirteen. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, past tense. Okay, uh, cross. God's love is at the cross. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works. The works of the law is what he's referencing. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision 
of circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope or without God in the, in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, us Gentiles being grafted in, okay? For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of twain one new man, so making peace. One new man, one new man, comprised of Jew and Gentile, one body, okay? One body. And go now to Galatians chapter 3. I know we read a little bit more. Had to, had to. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 on to verse 29. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptized, identified with Christ. Water baptism is not required for salvation today. Okay, you heretics, right? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's talking about salvifically. As pertaining to salvation, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? Culturally, there's a difference. Salvifically, pertaining to salvation, it doesn't matter. Okay, because the mystery is that us Gentiles have been grafted into the tree of the Jew. Okay, hence to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Okay, anyone can get saved. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Anyone can get saved. And if you come to the Lord on his terms and he save you, you are part of his body, the church of the living God. Okay, all right. And uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 under verse 14. Now, when the Lord saves you, you are sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit lives within you. Unlike any dispensation heretofore. Okay? It wasn't like that in the Old Testament, okay? You are eternally secure. You are going to heaven. You can't lose what isn't yours to lose. It's not your salvation to lose. And isn't it interesting, these charismatic devils who are mostly Pentecostal don't believe in once saved, always saved. Why? They can't because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me giving you a problem. No. See, they're taking Old Testament stuff under the law, trying to attribute it to today. Heresy. Heresy. Okay? Colossians chapter 3. If you are truly saved, Jesus is in you and you are a new creature. Okay? Colossians chapter 3, verses 800, verse 14. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor, uncircumc nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, elect meaning that you went the way of the cross, you didn't boot the door out of the way and go up some other way, okay? Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, 
Christ is in you. You are eternally secure. Yes, but remember, God doesn't force you at gunpoint to do anything, okay? Or else you would be a robot, okay? God wants you to make the right choices, okay? There, there are people of the Church of the Living God who are truly saved, born again, sealed unto the day of redemption, have the Lord within them, but they live just like the world. You have the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians that deal with that, okay? That talk specifically about that, okay? Specifically about that, okay? Yes, someone who is saved can make a total mess of themselves. But see, God wants you to make the right choice. He doesn't force you. God is within you, okay? He's going to, don't touch that, don't do that. He's going to guide you into all truth, okay? You got to remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 on to verse 21. Okay? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. See? For we pray you in Christ's stead, be that ye be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, God within you. We prophesy today, yes, someone who is saved has the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, living within them. Speak to you through the scripture. That is prophesying today. First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Again, talks about that. But as far as Old Testament prophets, no. No. Why? Because the Lord is in you permanently. He doesn't come and go, come and go. There are no Old Testament prophets today giving, uh, the, the Lord gave me a dream, a vision, and blah, blah, blah. No. The Lord doesn't operate that way today. Why? Because the Spirit of God is permanent in those who believe today, who are sealed unto the day of redemption, who are saved by His grace through faith. Okay? These people who have had dreams, these dreamers, these filthy dreamers, they're not saved. They're not of the church of the living God. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth and they're taking things from the Old Testament and applying them to, the, to today. Heresies. Heretics. Okay? Heretics. And, okay, so what are the conditions for today? Okay? That you come to God broken, broken, okay? You have to understand what? One, that you're not a good person. See, this is what the easy believism heretic likes to leave out, okay? The easy believism heretic will go to Romans chapter 3 and say, this is the pure gospel, when it's actually what this is talking about. This is the solution to your problem, okay? Okay? And the same easy believism heretics say, just believe. Hence, they are saving themselves by their own belief. Hence, booting the door out of the way, climbing up some other way. The devils, thou believest there is one God, the devils also believe and tremble. See, what the easy believism heretic omits. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to the close of the chapter. Oh, on to verse 28, excuse me. This is what the easy believism heretic omits omits. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means you. There is none that understandeth that. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, with whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Yes, because the law was there to show you that you can't save yourself. Okay? To show you how inadequate you are. Okay? You're not good. You have to be broken of your self-righteousness. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall, be, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. These easy believism heretics say prayer is a work. Calling on the name of the Lord is a work. No, the works that are being talked about here in Romans chapter 3, you devils, are the works of the law. Prayer, calling upon the name of the law is not a work. Okay? It's not. The works that are being talked about here, you wicked heretics, are the works of the law. You, you conveniently omit that stuff though, don't you? Yes, you do. But... Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember, the law, the prophets and the law prophesied until John, okay? But yet it was still binding because the perfect sacrifice had yet to be made, okay? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, but what about you personally? See, the easy believism heretic wants to hide you under the umbrella while not have it, while not you dealing personally with your own personal sins, which uh, 10 under verse 18 address. That's why they omit it. Okay? Being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And this verse 24 is usually where these easy believism scoundrels begin. Okay? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. See, you admit all that, omit all that other stuff and come to this and just concentrate on verses 23 on to verse 26. Just believe, just believe. We have all sinned. Yes, but what about your own personal sins? Personal, cutting you. They omit that. They don't like to deal with that. And then verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by, by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay? Without the deeds of the law. You have to be broken. You're not good. Yeah, everyone has sinned. Yeah, but see, you take that mentality. What happens? What happens when you're confronted? Oh, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Yeah, but see, someone who is truly saved, converted, and has the Lord within them, I'm worse than so-and-so. I'm worse. I'm a sinner who is chief. And see, someone who just believes saves themselves, you know, boots the door out of the way. Yeah. You save yourself. You're still full of pride. Okay. Heresy. Not broken. Okay. You're saving yourselves by your own belief. Okay. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, just one verse. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. True godly sorrow will lead you on to brokenness, fear of the Lord, 
Worldly sorrow, oh, I got caught. How many of the criminals that are in the jail over there are sorry just that they got caught? But see, if you are broken of your self-righteousness, knowing that you're not good, that sorrow is that you're not good. And God died because of you, because of what you did. But see, if you put an umbrella, then you can hide and say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. See, worldly sorrow. Oh, I, I wish I hadn't got caught. I'm sorry. Godly sorrow. You died for me. I should be the one on that cross. It should have been me, Lord. I deserve to go to hell. That's godly sorrow. It's your fault. And see, with easy believism, hiding under the umbrella, we're all sinners. Yeah. Worldly sorrow. Okay? And, and 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 11 on to verse 16. See how we did that? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. See, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 under verse 18, which the easy believism heretic omit, and after, what was it, verse 25, about talking about the deeds of the law, they omit all that and just concentrate on a little bracket to justify their heresy of just belief, without brokenness. Okay, brokenness, contrition, godly sorrow, fear of the Lord. Uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. I trust also are made, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance, and not in heart, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Terror of the Lord. Yes. Fear. Terror. Fear will produce terror. Okay? Terror. Produces, uh, uh, terror comes from what? Fear. Brokenness, contrition, the fear of the Lord. What does that produce? Romans chapter 10. Oh, what you easy believism scoundrels hate this. Yes, I know you hate it because you're not saved. You're not saved. You're saving yourself. Yes. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 on to verse 13. Here are the conditions. Here are the conditions. Brokenness, godly sorrow, contrition, and fear of the Lord. That happens in one fell swoop when the Lord breaks you through the scriptures. Okay? Romans chapter 10, verses 8 on to verse 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, broken. You're not good. You can't save your uh, can't save yourself. Godly sorrow. It's your fault that he died, and you ought to be the one on that cross, and you ought to go to hell. And fear of the Lord, because wow. He can't send me to hell. Okay? And that produces in you what? To call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. 
But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are some out there that's like, well, I've called on the name of the Lord a thousand times. And then, well, that's because you never were broken, Jason. You were never truly broken. You do not have true, true godly sorrow. You don't have true fear of the Lord. The people that you listen to have deceived you. Or you're saving yourself because you merely called on the name of the Lord. Right? Without uh, brokenness, contrition, or fear of the Lord. But hey, I'll just call on the name of the Lord. It says so. Hey, it says anyone who calls, hey, I, Lord Jesus save me and go on living like the devil without brokenness or contrition. No. So by grace through faith, those are the conditions for today. And how do you arrive at that faith? Through brokenness, Romans chapter 3. Godly sorrow, talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10. Verse 10, okay? And of course, godly sorrow is interwoven within the entire book of Romans, by the way. Okay? And Romans chapter 10, calling upon the name of the Lord in fear of him, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. By grace through faith, but you got to go on his terms. Broken and contrived to the cross. You can't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. That is how the that is the conditions for this dispensation. It's not just believe. You have to be broken and have godly sorrow, which will produce the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord will lead you to call upon the name of the Lord. You can't sidestep any of that and be genuinely converted. How does this dispensation end? How does this dispensation end? Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Not Ephesians, Brad. <laughs> Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. The redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, erroneously referred to as the time of, uh, excuse me, erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've got 13 minutes. <laughs> We're going to get this in here. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 on to verse 58. These are the basics. Talking about the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is talking about the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? Okay? Yes, we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? We will we'll talk about Matthew chapter 24 and how you Christians who get left behind are going to be going through the great tribulation. But those who are of the church of the living God, but no, 
we are not going through the time of Jacob's trouble because we get called up. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 18. Close of the chapter. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, we've talked about, you know, no, not everyone's going to see him. We're going to hear our names and come up hither, okay? Okay, we've talked about that. We're running out of time. I only got three hours. <laughs> so, okay? But we're going to hear our name come up hither, and then the church of the living God, those who are truly saved, born again, converted, new creatures in Christ Jesus, born again, we're going to be redeemed. The per redemption of the purchased possession. You and I are the church of the living God. We are purchased by his blood. Okay? The purchase of the blood of God, that's what bought us. The redemption of the purchased possession is when we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 3 on to verse 12. We've, we've talked about this in length, but what ends this dispensation we are currently in? The redemption of the purchased possession. That is what ends this dispensation. And think about all the chaos that's going to pursue ensue after that. Yeah. Think about those who are of the church of the living God who might be flying an aeroplane and all of a sudden disappear and that thing go crashing to the ground. What have you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 on the verse 12. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first Falling away is uh, those who said they... Hold on one second. Uh, let's very quickly... Oh, God, eight minutes here. <laughs> I hate being rushed. That's why I hate being rushed. I hate being rushed. Okay? That's my wife. I hate being rushed. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse uh, 19. What is the falling away? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That's the falling away. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no man, beginning at verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. What does that mean? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, he, who is the he? It's not, it's the body of Christ. The body of Christ be, that is on the earth, the church of the living God. God is omnipresent, omniscient. He's everywhere. He's not going anywhere. Okay? His representatives, his ambassadors, the church of the living God. Hi, us. We are on the earth. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, the body of Christ, the church of the living, not, living God, who now letteth, hindereth, will let until he, the church of the living God, be taken out of the way, redeemed, 
caught up. The redemption of the purchased possession. Once we get redeemed. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we the church of the living God get redeemed. And then that man of sin the son of perdition be revealed. In Revelation chapter uh, 6, I believe that is, and we're going to hit this in the following video, where he, the one horse goes out the uh, with a crown, okay? With a crown, uh, where is that? Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. And to conquer, that's that man of sin, the son of perdition. He, got, he is released after we, the church of the living God, get redeemed. Okay? Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Like so many of these people who are falling for these wicked heretics out there. Okay? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, this dispensation, by grace through faith, how do you arrive at that faith? How are you made right with God? By being broken of your self-righteousness, having godly sorrow, and in fear of the Lord, calling upon Him, uh, and calling upon the name of the Lord and he save you, okay? By grace through your faith. And your faith is the answer to his grace. So the first dispensation was what? All works. The second dispensation was faith in what God will do, okay? The third dispensation, the dispensation of the law, faith and works. Faith in what? The law, the works of the law that God will honor you because you did what the law required. And this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, by his grace through faith. Faith arrived at being broken and having contrition and in fear of the Lord, calling upon his name, and he saved you. Okay? Similar unto the dispensation of the patriarchs, but see, our faith is in what? The finished work of the cross. It is finished. Unlike any other dispensation, our faith is in on the Lord Jesus Christ in the finished work of the cross. Our faith is on Jesus Christ who paid for our penalty. It is finished. It is finished. That is what our faith is upon. Do you see? Okay. So those are the first four dispensations in Scripture. Okay. Uh, wow. Almost nearly three hours. Part two of this video, Lord willing, will be coming tomorrow where we will deal with the fifth, sixth, and seventh dispensation. Hopefully this will help uh, help you people, uh, those of you who have any questions about dispensations. Uh, remember, brethren, people, these people who are saying, I have dreamed a dream, they're taking things from the Old Testament under the law and trying to apply them to today. God does not operate that way. Why? Because the Holy Ghost lives within you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, Anyway, I gotta go. I'm gonna upload this video. Thank you for watching this. If you do, we love you. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.